I'm very excited in 2013 when the AAW hosted in Portland, Oregon. Walking through the hallway, I recognized him from his YouTube videos and I said hi. He probably doesn't remember it because he sees thousands of people, but I actually shook his hand and I met him. So I feel privileged and honored to finally get him to our club. He's he does a weekly YouTube video, and the, his channel is called As Wood Turns. He's done over 400 videos, and without any further ado, he calls himself not a professional, but I think he's pretty professional in my book. Please help me welcome Alan. Thank you. So... Uh, yeah, okay, you said all those things. One thing I want to invite you to participate in is the coming up is the 10th annual Christmas ornament challenge. So this is going to be the 10th year that I've hosted the Christmas ornament challenge and invite you to do it. There's an incentive for the club. If you're one of the top three clubs, you get another chance at a interactive uh, demo like this one of your choice. And uh, we can go on from there, but it's a whole lot of fun. The show that you've been seeing are last year's ornaments by made by uh, there's uh, almost 200 of them by over 120 different people, I, I, I believe, uh, if I remember the numbers. And uh, so there's some great work. I really like the variety of these things. Now, tonight I'm going to de be demoing one or two, depending on time, ornaments. And uh, but my quest almost is to go and go through those ornaments of last year and see how many of those I can duplicate uh, or at least put my, my spin on. So I invite you to do the same. If you need ideas, go to the, my website under challenges. You can find those. And uh, come November, which is the submission period for the time, uh, ornament challenge, I invite you to send in your picture and uh, we'll add it to the fun. Uh, we have another thing going on this year that's a little bit different. I am recruiting vendors who will, some of them will be offering coupons to participants and some will be offering grand prizes again. So I think we can do that again and, and spice it up just a, a little bit more. So any questions on the challenge? Now, some of you may have heard that uh, I passed away, but no, I didn't, I just cut my finger. So uh, if there's a doctor in the group, yes, I had three stitches. If, if you happen to own a Delta, a, a Jet, or a Grizzly, at least, 14-inch bandsaw, what you're generally worried about is there where the blade is, and you're focused, and you're cutting wood, and all those good things. But those saws have a return channel on the other side next to the on-off switch that is an open channel. And it is possible, let me tell you, to put a accidentally put a finger in that channel and require some stitches. So uh, be careful. Please check your bandsaw. If it's an open channel, figure out some way to cover it. People have suggested magnets, 3D print, uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, anything to cover it, keep your finger out of there. So, so. Now, uh, one thing I'd like to start off with is actually the last thing that I typically put on an ornament. And so, but I do have a pet peeve in this regard. So I'm going to put it out on the table now. Uh, my pet peeve is to see a hardware store eye hook in a delicate Christmas ornament challenge, uh, Christmas ornament because a hardware store eye hook to me is gross. <laughs> I don't know how, how else to put it particularly. I see delicate work in the, in the challenge and I'd like to offer a suggestion that uh, anybody can do uh, that uh, I think is more appropriate for an ornament. So to do that, I have here just a little piece of uh, 22 gauge wire. This is copper wire plated silver, but uh, you can get it in different colors and shapes and black, copper, gold, whatever. Uh, a spool is not that expensive and it'll last a long time if that's all you're using it for. So 22 gauge wire, all you'll probably need is uh, probably, well, 
I'll, I'll use two inches to start with. Now in my lathe here, once you switch to overhead, it, or, yeah, that's good. Okay, in my lathe here, I have my Jacobs chuck. All that matters is that it's something that can hold a drill bit in uh, reversed, or in this case, I have a set of transfer punches from Harbor Freight. They've, they're cheap. Uh, I've used them a lot more than I ever thought I would. But uh, whether it's a drill bit, uh, just pick the size that you want. Take your little piece of wire, wrap it around there. Grab a set of pliers, vice grips would be best. Clamp down on there and then just twist it up. Now you can twist to here, which is uh, probably a, a loose twist, or you can go a little bit further and make it a very, very tight twist. That doesn't really matter because most of that's going to be hidden once you, do your, once you finish your ornament. So uh, there we go. Uh, then I'll just clip off the uh, excess. And there is a little delicate little eyelet thing that can then be, yeah, I have here an ornament that I drilled a little hole in. And there we go. It doesn't try and overpower the rest of the ornament. So just as, as a simple, what is an ornament? It's, there's a very open definition of an ornament. It's whatever you think will be ornamental. Uh, we generally think of tree ornaments, but they can be freestanding. Uh, almost anything goes. In this case, I want it suspended. So yeah, I put an ornament on there or a hanger on there. In this case, I turned a perfect sphere, drilled a hole in it, then drilled another hole through it for the, uh, for the hanger and then made a finial for the bottom. So that's a very simple one. Although I, I do uh, advocate everyone learn how to make a hand cut perfect sphere. I view that as an a, a cent, essential skill for any wood turner. Okay, here's another one that I just barely made, but uh, it's actually, if you look through the slideshow, uh, you see something like this. So what is this? Well, it is a, if you've ever made natural edge bowls, this is a very small little bowl. And then it has a finial with a very, very short tenon on the end here. And then I drilled another hole in the top of that. So a three eighths inch tenon that I then sanded to much shorter, needed it longer to begin with. And it goes up through. And then I made a top finial for this one down through that, we'll fasten the two together. I'll put a loop on the top and there we go. Let's see, does this do better? Okay, anyway. So I, I like this one, so from last year, so I felt I had to do it. So this is uh, a walnut limb and then a piece of more heartwood walnut for the finial. And on the top, that is cherry. So keeping it in the orchard here. So that's a, a fun one also. The, excuse me. Oh, how is the wire secured into here? Well, you're all familiar with CA glue. Just fill that little hole with a little CA glue, stick the wire in, wait a while, you're good. At least that's my technique. Um, if you want Alan, to have a little, I, little more friction. I, Alan, can I ask a question? I sure. think I think the question in the chat about the wire was on the ornament before this where you had hollowed it out and it, it was there enough wood in there to CA that wire into that? Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Da, 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 maybe pull it back up. Well, let's see. So this is uh, what about two inches. Here's my finger. Didn't go in that far, so oh, okay. I, I left a lot of meat Good. on Thank that you. one Okay, uh, to do that. Or for this one, if you're going to go out and have it a little bit thinner, you could actually make it a little bit longer and bend it on the inside. However, just a risk point, if you're going to bore that hole from the bottom up that tight, 
your chances of breaking through are pretty good too. So uh, you do have to exercise some planning <laughs> in these things. So that's uh, okay. So that answers the question on this one. It's a simple little ornament. So tonight, let's do one that did a little bit more. I haven't got a loop on it yet, but it is a little bit more complicated. It's a favorite. It's been a favorite of mine since I very first saw one, but it's a sea urchin. You know, some were talking about uh, abalones and sea urchins uh, before the call. Were they this style, this Putnik sea urchins, or were they some other sea urchin? I don't think ours are that style. Do you know some Sam? other? Yeah, they're they're got more spines. They're not the Putnik kind. Yeah, they're smoother, oh, okay. right? Yeah. Well, yeah. this is the this is the guts and the shell, and I guess uh, if you can't dive for them, you're going to have to uh, buy them on Amazon. Anyway, uh, so this is, is consists of a top finial. Again, I've got a hole in the very top for a hanger, a sea urchin shell. I got these uh, when the Utah wood, uh, wood Turning Symposium was still active, but from Cindy Drozda. And then a, another piece, I've got a central dowel and then a bottom finial. So it's made in pieces and that makes it easy because if you then mess something up and don't like it in the end, you can just replace it. Uh, I also was able to use the dowel to help me buff it so that I could have something to hang on to. So let's start with this one. Uh, now, a, a standard, standard, is there such a thing as a standard sea urchin? Uh, when you see them, you generally find that there's a top hole and a bottom hole. So this is the one we'll make tonight. And uh, then, of course, the shell. Now, my wife has gone in and actually taken these and, and painted the inside with a little white glue. And that really helps stabilize them just a tad more. Otherwise, they're really super fragile. But the holes are always a little bit ragged. I don't know what's with these sea urchins, but they, they don't seem to try, make a uniform top and bottom hole. Um, somebody else can maybe tell me more the anatomy of the sea urchin. So, are you uh, hearing me and seeing me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So let's get rid of this. the Harbor Freight transfer punches. Is that. So one thing that I found very useful was to, uh, to even out those holes was to make myself a little sanding fixture. Now this fixture fits my chuck. And so it's just a cone with a little uh, pressure sensitive sandpaper strips glued on the cone of it. The, I, want, I made it so that the, the biggest diameter is larger than the whole bottom hole on the sea urchin. And the bottom one is uh, so that the top hole can fit. And then uh, even with that, then the PSA sandpaper didn't want to stick very well. So I did have to use a little bit of thin CA or medium CA to, uh, to actually stick the paper down, wrapped a rubber band around it so that it would st stick long enough to actually solidify. So that is, has a tenon on it, size to fit my chuck. Okay. Okay. Had something in the way. Okay. So then we'll just turn this on and uh, 
gently push it in there, even up those edges, turn it around. I already did some of this beforehand so that I, it will take you twice as long as it just took me uh, probably to get it in. So, but very gently do it because yeah, they, they are fragile uh, in the end. So that's enough of me sitting down. I now got to stand up to do my work. Bit of that. So for the body of our ornament, well, let me put that, leave that in. For the body of our ornament, that's all we're going to need is uh, that, because that's, uh, uh, we could do a wood one later if we have time or whatever. But uh, so we do uh, say the top end first. How about a little, that's not going to work. Neither is that. Okay. Got to change jaws then. Just a note, I do have more than one chuck body for my jaws. Many of you may know Kirk to here. He's uh, actually in one of the clubs I belong to here in Utah. <sighs> he uh, made a point once that uh, you have multiple, generally you have multiple jaw sets to be sized for different projects. But then when you're on the margin of one and you say, oh, I really should change my jaws but you don't because it requires that you spend 15 minutes finding the uh, driver and, uh, and taking the jaws off and putting the new set on. And then you find that you got to change them back later. Uh, it's a royal pain in the neck. So you don't change your jaws and you push it just a little bit. Pushing it is when you're going to get hurt. <laughs> and, uh, and so then what is the cost of a trip to the emergency room and the pain and suffering involved in, in healing up because you didn't change the jaws. So compare that to the cost of another chuck body and say, hmm, where's the cost trade-off, pain, chuck body. Uh, I went ahead and, and got another chuck body. So let's make a top finial first. Other than putting a guard on your uh, bandsaw, please do wear a face shield whenever the lathe is running. If you go back uh, nine or 10 years ago in my videos, you can see why I'm so emphatic on that because I was turning a beautiful piece of wet apricot and uh, there was a bark inclusion that I had not noticed. And it uh, came apart at the wrong time, hit me in the middle of the forehead. Uh, face shield went, I was wearing my face shield. It went flying. The wood went flying. The lathe started dancing across the floor. I was on the ground. Uh, fortunately, I'm still alive and can tell you about it. And it, I did catch it on video. So, uh, if you ever want a lesson in why you wear a face shield, look up that video. Otherwise, don't look it up, just wear your face shield. So for a top finial, I'm not, I personally don't like huge top finials. So uh, I'm gonna keep it fairly short, but the thing I want to do for right now is say, okay, I want to size a tenon to the size of that hole. So I never trust the measure, the calipers that close, but I'll start with that. That's going to be about three quarter inch diameter thereabouts. So uh, let's make that a little bit bigger. What was it three quarter? Yeah, I moved it. That's why I don't trust it because I don't trust myself. Let's make it a little bit bigger. 
and I'm, I want to turn that tenon, turn that tenon on that side down to that size. Now this is my oh, just a, a note before I'll, before I get busy. Uh, most of the uh, tools that I, the tools that I will be using tonight will be a lot of my skew. It's a half inch skew. My parting tool, maybe a round nose scraper, maybe my favorite bowl gouge, and quite possibly my spindle spindle gouge. Now, since this is so much wood that I have to take down, I'm going to go ahead and use my bowl gouge to start with. That ought to be enough to get going here. I've still got a ways, well, not too much further to go. Or to start with, I'm going to, I'm wanting a peeling cut with my skew. To me, a skew is handy because it can either cut or scrape. It's the original negative rake scraper. So as usual, this is a fitting job. So let's just fit it to the calipers first. I know that's big. Again, a peeling cut going in a little bit more. And since I'm starting at the end, if I cut too much, I can over just move down a little bit more and salvage this thing. So just a smidge more. This is a long one, so I'm going to keep the tail rest in place. There's a little line there that was from the uh, sea urchin powder from the sanding. I can use that. Let's just give it a little taper on the end. Fitting a tendon to the mortise, I find to be probably the more, more, more of the more tedious operations but it's essential. That will be nice. Okay. One other thing we need to do right now before I forget, because I invariably I will forget. Sorry, I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't confess that I frequently forget, but I will. That is, we're going to join this together with a quarter inch dowel. And the reason for the quarter inch dowel is that, again, that sea urchin shell is very fragile and you really don't want to put a lot of pressure on it. So the dowel is going to connect the top finial to the bottom finial and it's going to take any pressure and the sea urchin shell itself will just kind of rest and sit on those on the top and bottom uh, tenons. This wood is walnut from an old table. So let's just the only thing for uh, choosing wood for a finial, almost anything goes except that you do want it straight grain. You don't want to use a burl because you don't know where the grain is going. So straight grain means the grain is not going off to the side. It's going up and down so that then you can count on it being there. Let's see. Did we go deep enough? Maybe we went too deep. Ooh, that's a long way. Now, because I'm using a uh, straight jaw on this, I'm actually going to extend this tenon just a little bit more. That and I just, since I just drilled it so deep, I got plenty of room. So let's just take this. And take it down. We can always shorten it later. 
Let's make sure it still fits. Nope. This is the top one. We don't want it resting on it anyway, so. But you don't want to wobble. Oh, okay. Guess I have a little bit more to go. You gotta be kidding me. Still not there. Well, I can feel it this time at least. Now it'll probably be too small. There we go. Okay, so we have a tenon, we have a hole, it's fitting the sea urchin. Now let's do a little bit of shaping from this end before we flip it around. So that's going to be there. So let's just, I wanna get in between the spines just a little bit. So let's just make this a little bit steeper. Right there. I need a little more room, so. No sense reaching for a gouge when a skew will do. So let's see, in terms of length wise, we'll go somewhere about there. So now it's a matter of what shape will emerge from this. Hmm. Okay, so that's coming out. Let's maybe start with a bit of a bead. So I've switched over to my spindle gouge because I've got more of a curve in the in mind than what my uh, skew will do. Let's give it a little more speed so it cuts faster and smoother. Let's just go for a squatty pond. I'm gonna refine it a little bit so I can get in tighter and deeper with this. My skew again. There, there. If you want, now's a good time to put a burn line in. I got tired of the wire ones uh, always been in the wrong spot. And so I made them myself a triple one, just three guitar strings. One's broken, needs to be replaced, but let's just go ahead and smoke that one in a little bit. Then I can hang that and back up and it's not going anywhere on me. Now at this point, if this were not a demo, I would sand this one, uh, sand this finial. Let's see, where did my finish go? It hit the floor. And my favorite finish for finials like this is going to be a shellac friction polish. Shellac is easy to blend in with uh, previous coats. It dries really fast. So if we just put that on there, put it in, and then as soon as it's dry, which is not long, actually rub it in. This is not going to be particularly shiny with uh, without sanding it, but uh, 
we're not wanting to, to do a lot of dusty work here. I guess it's my lungs that take this time, not yours, but it's your time. So, okay, at this point then, if that's going to be all our finial, we still need to do a little bit more. And I could, uh, well, let's just use a, my skewed Sandy. I left plenty of spare so I could break it off. Let's take that and refine it just a little bit more before we go on. So these are my long nose jaws that will go down to this size of my jaw sets. Now there's only a couple of things we need to do here. We need to clean up the end and drill a hole. Remember, we got to hang this somehow. If you're anything like me, you forget about the hole until later. And then you say, oh, how do I do it? Fortunately on this, the tenon is still going to be there. So you can go back and get it later. But we want a flat end of this. So let's just Yeah. Let's get that center out of there. What did I do with the, yeah, I left it out where I could lose track of it. I'm going to use one of my, Unfortunately, this chuck will not take my smallest. Let's see if it can hold this one. Now you wanna, with these small bits, you wanna put that in there just as far as you can to limit the flex that you're gonna get out of it. If a machinist were doing this, he'd be using a starting bit and then finishing it off with another one. But. A uh, real stubby little bit, but uh, I don't need that precision. So let's get just get that close. Three eighths to a half inch will be enough. Put away that bit before I lose track of it, which do if I leave it out and since that so at this point then that's we would say I would sand this and also and then uh, again apply some shellac to this end to that be had a raw wood and rub it in again And very often that's enough of a shine. You can get a little bit more shine if you buff it, but that's good enough, I think, for this one. So that will be our top finial for the sea urchin. I've got one spine interfering a little bit, but that'll be okay since it's not going to be setting on it anyway. So there's the top of our ornament with the sea urchin. Now, next problem we have is that the bottom is huge. That is almost an inch and a quarter in diameter. Now, if you choose a spindle that, to turn that, you, then you've got to have, you've got to probably start with a two inch 
uh, square spindle to get enough wood to do this. And if you're dealing with exotic woods, that would be very expensive. When it'd be better, you get four times as much wood, uh, for, uh, at least in terms of end product for your money, if you can use one inch or less wood uh, for this, for the whole finial. So instead of doing that, let us, oh, let's take another piece of scrap wood. And now this is paduk that I have uh, from a previous project. And I have mounted it to a faceplate. I use a lot of threaded faceplates, just use a beel tap and some poplar. And I use these over and over and over again. Get that out of the way, get the chuck off. Any questions? We're moving on to the next piece of our ornament. Good time for questions for the first, first part. This is just so, like the spacer piece, Alan? This is going to be a filler in between the bottom finial and the ornament. So we go back to our finished one. It's going to be this one. Just a, all okay, it consists of is a tenon that will fit the bottom of the shell. So we're going to have another fitting job. And then we're going to put a uh, hole through it. Hmm, did I make that half or three eighths? I think it's half, yeah. So then I put a half inch hole through it. Then the, my bottom finial could have a tenon for that size. And then a dowel that can go through to mount it all. So the, the urchin will actually fit and sit right on that filler strip right there. And I can easily, I can play with around with this to mate that to the sea urchin, pretty good. And then it's a fairly typical job to mate these two woods together. I happen to use the put up because it was laying around my shop, but any, any wood of your choice would do. Uh, this is going to be cross grain. It's whatever will work for you. Did that answer your question? Yes, that was helpful. You bringing that up and showing us the old one. Thank you. Okay, so let's see here. Sea urchin, sea urchin, here we go. So I've got to fit it to that. And that's going to be in the neighborhood of just under 1.2 inches. Oh, I'm sorry, Alan. How is that Paduk attached to your uh, chuck there? I, I type bond. Oh, you just glued it on. Okay. I just glued it on. So now okay. I need a pencil. What happened to my pencil? There's a pencil. So. Have you ever seen a demonstrator say, I need this measure and we'll put the calipers to that edge and then give you a very distinct warning to not touch this side, not touch the point there to it, but only touch this side because why? Because if you do touch it, it throws, you in, throws it in your face. So I used to do that and now I've decided I won't. What I will do is I will just put that up there, make a mark that I think is pretty close, spin it around. Okay, so now I know it's a circle and see if that's pretty close. That actually is maybe a little bit small. So now, now maybe I can turn it on and say, well, really I want my nut line up there. Wait for it to stop and then put it up there against and say, yeah, that's what I want to cut to. I didn't have any risk of a point catching and throwing this in my face. So I don't do the other way anymore. I used to, but <laughs> I've changed my ways. So I'm going to start with a spindle gouge.
Can't go very far here without testing because, oh, that's really close. But now I'm gonna switch. I like to do my sizing with my skew. Taper. If I cut too far, I still got a lot of wood I can deal with to uh, advance into. Oh, that's oh so close. That's actually starting to fit on, but my hole is tapered, so it will take a little more fitting. So let's bring this up a little bit more. Let's square that off a tad more. At least Paduk has a nice smell to it. Seems to me to be a, a sweet smell as opposed to walnut and elm and smell like a barnyard. Probably the worst to me is Russian olive. I still need a little more. Okay. But I can make that tenon a little bit longer now. I think I'm good for that. Does Coca Bolo bother you? I haven't turned that much Coca Bolo. How does it smell? It's more oily, and some people say it irritates their skin, but um, it's my favorite wood. Ah, it is a pretty wood. I also like mesquite, but then I decided I found that I'm allergic to mesquite, so I've decided that's not my favorite wood anymore. So that's a bit tight here on that end. I need to take it a little bit more. Okay, so I do have, it fits. I do have some spines in the way. I'll deal with that in a minute. But that's the fit that I want. Let's find that chuck again, Jacob's chuck. And let's find a uh, half inch bit. Let's confirm that it's a half inch bit. Yep. How many times have you just grabbed a bit saying, oh, that looks like the right one. It's the wrong size. Sometimes really hard to redrill that hole. Let's turn down the speed for drilling. Too slow. And this time I'm gonna drill until I don't get orange wood. By the way, I appreciate these questions that are coming up as they are because sometimes in doing these remote demos, I just feel like I'm talking to myself. Then I think I'm going crazy. So thank you. Yeah, I've given one demo and that's the whole thing. You just feel like you're talking and talking. So I'm trying to give you a little bit just from my mini experience of giving one single demo. And I appreciate it. So <laughs> you know how it feels then. At least if Chris we're is live. Great if that counts. <laughs> okay. If this were live, I could at least read your face and see how many people were asleep, but I can't even see how many people are asleep yet. Okay, so I don't need to do anything else with this end over here, but that will serve double duty because that tenon will fit my sea urchin, and it's also going to be the tenon that I'm going to use to grab it with the chuck. But I do know that I was interfering with some spines of the sea urchin, so I'm going to now shape this a little bit more above that Taper it up a little bit. Let's see how it looks. It's another adventure doing these. 
Let's take it down just a bit more, see if we can get it inside some of those spines. A little more speed. Another question generally comes up is what speed am I running? I don't have a uh, meter on this lathe, so I have to say it's just fast. It's medium, medium fast because this is a small diameter item. And when it's small diameter, the surface speed of which that at the wood is turning, because it really matters how fast it's coming at the tool, that's actually fairly low compared to a big diameter thing. So it's fast. Uh, but that spine's interfering. Hmm. You know what, I think I'll sand that spine off a little bit more and we'll call this good. So, will that look good now? Huh, you're not hearing the lathe sounds, okay. Hmm, yeah, except through my mic. I think it's okay that we're not hearing the late sounds. Does anybody else want to hear them? I don't. I don't think we need to. Well, we'd have to mix in another microphone, and then I who knows what to. you're really going to get. I we don't need to. I think it's a Zoom <laughs> setting, though. There's a Zoom setting that controls background noise, and it has like five settings, and you can, depending on which setting you're on, you'll hear more of the late sound. Oh, okay. Just for future information. Uh. Let's not do that now. No, don't mess with it now. <laughs> we don't <laughs> want to screw that up. <laughs> right. Okay, so right now, this is another excellent opportunity to do a little bit of sanding. Because, and, and the reason I, I like to you say, okay, you can do it later, but I like to do it now because I'm going to grab this with my chuck right up to here. And so then, and I'm gonna, do I wanna sand it later or grab it later? So I'd really wanna sand this side now and put finish on it now, and then I don't have to worry about it again. So since we're, we have now officially sanded this, so let's go ahead and just put some finish. We don't need to put it on the tenon particularly, but it always seems to go there anyway. But that tenon is, uh, well, let's go ahead and make sure we get it on there because actually that's not going to be glued to anything. So it may as well get some finish just in case it shows through. Get that out of the way so I can safely spin it up. Yeah, that'll do. And now we can part it off. So I get for reaching under, I hit this off button. Got it. Didn't have to go quite to the center because remember we drilled that hole through there earlier. So we're finished with that face plate and I will just face that off again, throw it in the box with another dozen of them until I want to use it again for another project. So let's get back to the long nose chuck. Stick it on there. That's a really short tenon for very straight non dovetail jaws. So let's do be careful. For now, let's bring up a cone center. I, I, I like the point center most of the time, but this is the time when I really want a cone center because it fits in the hole 
pick up the slack, gives me a good solid mount there. And then I can tighten my jaws a little bit more with it a little bit more comfortable that it's going to be centered. It's never precisely centered. It's always some change, but in woodworking, we generally don't worry about that. If I were a metal worker, I'd be really worried about that. So all we need to do now is to take a little bit more off this end. That for me is going to be spindle gouge work. And let's just keep it simple. I'm going to leave the creativity in the challenge to y'all. So we won't try and do a super masterpiece tonight. Just want to get you through the basics of it. And we can go down a little bit more. Time to take this away, but now I gotta be a lot more gentle. wrong side but so now what do we do grab our shellac and we I was gonna sand, say sand and sand and shellac. finish yeah. absolutely Perfect. right you never know when you're going to be needing to say i was finished with that after all therefore it has the finish on it that it needs and even when I'm having to sand something a little bit more, shellac still blends in very nicely. If I were using something like a varnish, you'll see the line. Uh, but shellac works well with that. Uh, lacquer does pretty good. Oil does great. But I like shellac for these. So I think we're done with that. Uh, How did you like that accelerated sanding? That was pretty fast. No dust either. No dust either, especially on your end. Okay, so here we go. Let's give a close up on that. There we go. So that's where we are so far. So now what are we going to do for a finial? Well, let's see. This is about one hand, maybe another hand, maybe another hand. How about, the, about that long? That would give a one third, two thirds ratio. That is a good golden mean sort of thing to start with it's not an absolute it's whatever looks good in the end so let's take this chunk of walnut again and i want to use the same marks if i can It's always off just a little bit anyway. So anytime you change it in the chuck, it's going to be different. Oh, okay. There's a lot of people that pride themselves on starting with 300 grit or 220 grit and whatever. Uh, when I was 16, actually just under 16, I was hired by an auto body shop. I was cutting the owner's lawn uh, and he said, uh, and he had a car that he had bid on and they, it was uh, having to strip it. It was, uh, let's see, 1959 T-Bird with the nice wings on it. The problem with this car is that it had six coats of paint on it and several episodes of body work. And he'd had two guys quit already. And he said, well, I may as well try the kid. So he hired me and I stayed for three years. Um, 
So I have spent a lot of time sanding cars. And if I ever started sanding a car with 220 grit, I would have been fired. We started with 80 and sometimes backed off to 60 uh, to get it smooth, to feather out between the paint. And it was only the final coats that we'd go to 400 on. So I always start with a coarser grit. Now with a spindle, I can sometimes, I can often get away with 180 grit to start with because it's so small, so fine, small areas. Uh, instead of 80 grit, but on a bowl or something like that, 80 grit, if not 60. 60 if I have a, a lot of tear out to get rid of. So don't be afraid of, if you're spending more than a couple of minutes at a grit, you're on the wrong grit, go to a coarser grit. What kind of, this is a Vicmark chuck. I like Vicmarks. Uh, however, it's the first main chuck that I bought, so I, therefore I like it. Uh, I, I have standardized on Vicmark because I don't want to have to find a different key to fit different chucks as I swap between chucks. So the main feature that I say to make sure that they're all the same chuck is to use all the same key. I can keep it right here handy and I have to look for a different type. I do use another one and it's a pain to find that chuck key every time. So let's go back to this thing. Uh, it's a bit thick still. Let's see, size wise, we're gonna have a bit of a tenon on the end and then about a hand and then about a hand. And then so, we're gonna make it about that long, but I can change that later if it's not looking good. So start with, let's just get it down to size and take out that a little bit of eccentricity and let's take it down somewhat closer to what we will need. So why am I going straight into the green with that not going back and forth, back and forth? As I'm going in here, I'm cutting side grain. If I go along here, I'm starting to cut some end grain. What's easier to cut? Side grain. So I just wasted a lot of wood very quickly. And that's just a, a standard bowl gouge and not a fancy uh, spindle roughing gouge. Shaving's all over the place now. But so now our first task, going back to our sea urchin now, is that we need to make a tenon that will fit down here into this hole, into that spacer between the two. So that was half inch. So let's pull this and set it tad big. Okay, we've got a long way to go. I'm gonna to switch to my skew now, I think will be a good one. Feeling cut. I need enough to grab. That's more than I'll need for the sea urchin, but I can bury the excess in the shell where I can sand it off. Am I close? Ooh, I'm really close. <laughs> I may have cut too far. That never happens to anybody else, I understand. So. Nope, oh, we've never done it. Never done it? Okay, but fortunately, I set my calipers a tad big, so I'm still good. That's why you're a pro. I won't tell you how many times I've forgotten that. <laughs> anyway. So let's give it a little bit of chamfer on the end, and... Take it down a little bit, and then with that chamfer, we can have a better read on it. Either end works. Oh, beautiful. Oh, look at that. Oh, how lucky can I be? I'm never that lucky. Okay, 
But this is a time where you're going to forget to do something critical. Sand and shellac? Uh, nope. Drill a hole? Drill a hole. <laughs> Ask me how I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask because I already know from personal experience. So let's grab this out. And we said that that's going to be a quarter inch hole for the dowel, standard hardwood dowel, hardwood, hardware store dowel. So let's just go with this. I have to have my ram out about a half an inch before I can really seat that. And then let's pull it up, turn down the speed, turn up the speed. Let's see. Let's try and officially gauge this. So right now, my mark's at one inch. So two inches ought to do. If I go too much further, it's going to maybe interfere with how much I can shape the bottom. Got other wires up here that bother me. Okay, so we remembered to do that. Whew. Let's get rid of this again. I've heard other people doing uh, finial demonstrations that say, do not use tail stock support. Do not use live center support because it will throw it off. Well, that is true, but probably insignificant in if you've chosen a nice, good straight grain wood. So I'm going to use tail stock support. Plus I have a very long piece of wood here, longer than what I need. And, uh, it will wobble like crazy if, if I don't have some tailstock in there. So now the question is, what kind of finial shape do I want? And what are the rules? Ah, there aren't any. Uh, there's just some general guidelines. Personally, I do not like really thick finials. Other people may do. So like this piece here that was uh, one that I blew, to me, uh, that on the bottom of a sea urchin shell would be really gross, big, uh, not my taste. So we've already taken this thing and uh, we've done the reduction down with the spacer, which is going to be fairly inobtrusive. So now what's, what do we want to net? And I'd say this is on the thick side still, but that's okay, that's what I'm gonna start with. So let's... Uh, See what we're going to do. What comes out of this piece of wood? Since it's a thin spindle, let's turn up the speed. Peel this down and say, hmm. Got a flat there. Let's just taper this down a little bit. Maybe like that for the interface between the two. Give yourselves a little bit more room. Let's take that down smidgen more. But I am trying to leave a fair amount of wood out here because if I go too, th if I waste it down too thin, there are two, th two bad things can happen. One, it can start flexing, uh, even, uh, even in this setup. And number two, I may want it thicker in my design, so I would over overcut and then I'm limited. So let's see, we would have this so far. Hmm. How about a bead or at least a half bead? So let's 
It doesn't have to be symmetrical. Let's just take it down like that. Cut it in. That seems a bit thick to me still. Take that in. I'm getting close, so let's take this down. Generally speaking, I think you want your features to be reducing in size as you go down the finial. So with that, let's make this a more of a flat bead. And maybe to here. Just gotta be careful to watch out for that quarter inch hole I have in there. It's going into there somewhere. And now my skew is a negative rake scraper. So how do you think that will look? Okay. Groovy. <laughs> Or is it bumpy? I was going to say beady, but then, you know, Simon and Garfunkel is going through my mind. Okay. I want this. That is more of a scrape than a cut, but okay. Okay, so let's make this a longer feature. Can you cut a cove with a skew? You can. Looks like it. <laughs> Looks like it, right? I actually need more speed. Yeah, it's a little bit fat there. Okay. Let's give this a little bit of a beady look. A little bit of a hump going into it. A little corner there, let's get that out with a scrape action. Give yourself some more working room. And let's just make this smaller. You didn't see that whoopsie there, did you? Nope. nope. <laughs> okay, so now So where do you find shapes that you want to put into your finial? Look at almost anything in art or architecture, pottery, harvest your ideas from whatever. In fact, one of the great things about the uh, ornament challenge is when somebody takes something from a totally strange, different environment and incorporates it into an ornament. I love it. That's for the experts. If you're not an expert, just do your best. 
man, let's just make this maybe a Ellen, is your face shield up? Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. One of the places I like for is to walk through museums and just keep an eye open for designs. Even better if they'll let you take a picture. Yeah, well, most of them will. Okay, well, I got a little bit of cleanup there to do. I guess I have a, another opinion when it comes to finials on an ornament, and that is. Generally speaking, there's going to be kids around. So I don't like sharp points on a ornament that's going to be hanging from a tree and accessible to kids. So I always want them blunt because I don't want them to be a spear. So I'm just going to end this one with just a little bit of... Let's give it just a little bit there. Need some more. It's looking pretty fat still. It's too fat, decorate a little bit. Couple of grooves. So let's actually sand this one. I'm gonna start with 180, despite everything I said before because this is such small work and I'm actually sanding at a fairly high speed and I think that's okay for a small spindle like this. Now, but the thing I'm trying to be careful of when I'm sanding here is to try and respect the features that I have there and not just grossly sand over them. I'm trying to sand right up to an edge here. Now you may have a different style of finial in mind, that's fine. Nobody has a lock on the correct finial. Do you send in reverse as well? Yep. Oh, oh with reverse speed? Mm -hmm. uh, no. Forward and reverse, yeah. I haven't found that really necessary for a spindle. I've got a little line right there that I don't like. Holding the paper to try and get in there. Yeah, I got it. Go up to there. Go up to there. So that was 180. I'm gonna go over to, I'm actually, since it's a fine spindle, break all the rules and go up to, uh, 320. Do you always sand on the top? I've always come from underneath. Is there a, is that a safety issue? Uh, whatever works looks for like, you. Looks like he's doing both. <laughs> There's under. Now, if this didn't have support, I would be putting a finger under and a sandpaper over like this or wrap it around like this. 
so that I'm not putting too much pressure on one way or the other, but I am supported here. Yeah. So actually I can be pretty rough. So let's get this little piece there, that there, that there, that there, there, there. Okay, let's take, uh, let's just burn a couple of those points in the very bottom. It's well supported now, so I can think I can safely do it right near, like here. There's a good burn. The groove is just a good marker to get it started. But whenever I burn, I want to do a little sanding afterwards. So my final grit is going to be now. I could probably spend another 15 minutes sanding this, but I won't. <laughs> now what? Shellac. Exactly. See, we're not sleeping. Well, maybe some are, but. <laughs> well, I can't see you. Maybe you can scope out your compadres that see who is sleeping. There's a couple of guys that uh, in our club meeting that invariably come sit on the front row and uh, not long after they're asleep. <laughs> we have one of those as well. I won't say his name. But I got to admit that watching somebody else turn is not the same as turning yourself. I can easily stay awake when I'm turning but I'm not sure I can always stay awake when somebody else is turning. I have to work at it. So let's make sure I get some good polish there. Let's crank it up to full speed here. I are can pinch. Are you feeling the, the heat with that as you're holding it? Or oh yeah. Getting that hot? yeah. I can feel it through four layers of paper towel right now. Yeah. So it's pretty warm, but that was, uh, that's the one speed I can quote you. That's 3000. Okay. So now that this bitter end here, it's not looking very pretty. Cause now I want to Turn it down a little bit. Let's take this out. So if, I don't know how much you can see of how much run out there is on that, but there is some. Yeah, we see a wobble. Okay, so if I had not used this, I wouldn't have that wobble, but I don't think that wobble is going to bother this ornament at all. So I'm going to say just fine. I could have reduced it by doing, uh, by starting, only taking it, in my shaping uh, down to about this first little part so that I could get this very first part uh, shaped and shellacked and sanded and whatever before I turn it off. Then I could turn it around into the chuck like I'm going to do next and do just the, and do the rest of it. Uh, but then you gotta, you also then have to have your tool here and you gotta support it underneath. And I find that a little bit scary and awkward, so. If I can, I'm going to get away with this. Well, let's just do a process check here. Say, that going to look decent? Yeah, I think so. Yes. If anything, it's a trifle long in my book, but we're not done. Find my chuck key, 
Take out that last piece of wood. That'll be a top finial for something. Since I have a handy tin in there, I can scrunch that down. Let's. So how close is that? Let's see how much runout we have from that. Oh wow! Good Very work. Nice. Yeah, good. Not bad at all. But that end's ugly. I think I'll just do it with sandpaper. Come on, little line there. That's extra line I don't want. Rid of that. And now if I sand into my previously finished area, which I have, all I got to do is make sure that on my next grit, I go at least that far again. And since that's an edge, that's easy. Now what? Shit, 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 shit. Something along that line, right? Oh, I was going to correct one little spine. Let's go do that next. Not quite done. One beautiful thing about making an ornament in segments is you can go back and fix one or replace it. So I'm just going to fix the shell just a little bit more. But going back to... This chuck and I'm going to use my sanding. Hmm, that only happens to me too. Ah. I think the shavings are down there to catch the stuff you drop. Yeah, that's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> Got a cush, cushion, cushion the impact. Yeah. Okay, so I had one little point here that was bothering me. Oh, the inner dowel, I, to hold it together, I picked a quarter inch fairly randomly. I, want, I wanted to, to uh, I guess I wanted it, uh, I could have gone maybe eighth, but then eighth, I can't hold in my uh, long nose jaws very well. The smallest that it can comfortably hold is a quarter. And so then uh, I wanted at least an eighth inch wall on each side of that ten tenon going through to hold it together. So that meant uh, quarter plus eighth plus eighth means, means half for the, the, uh, the tenon on the spindle. And then other than that, I like three eighths because it's a little bit more comfortable to hold with my long nose jaws. I'm going to have to have you repeat that in a minute.
But the question was the length of the dowel. How do you know? How do you control the length and fit the length of that dowel? Okay. So, okay. How do I size the length of that dowel? Well, that's a, actually a very good question. So, yeah, I'm comfortable with that now. So there we go. So I know that it's going to go into there about an inch. Then you have about an inch and a half there and a little bit there. So maybe start with a three inch dowel. And if you put it all together and your top doesn't go on, your top's too proud, then sand it off a little bit. I use a disc sander, just take off an eighth of an inch at a time or whatever looks good and then seat it down there together. You want it to be so that the urchin is able to just rest on the bottom, but not be constrained particularly by the top. So it's a, it's a very exact science. It's uh, test it, see if it works. If it doesn't work, send it smaller. <laughs> I think that answers Chris's question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Next question. What time do we have here? Uh, 735. 735. PST. Okay. So that's uh, pretty much, unless I start another project, that's the demo. What kind of glue do you use to tie that together? I just use tight bond. Okay. Um, you can get as exotic as you want, uh, but to me, I would use tight bond in there, but I would use uh, CA for the uh, wire that mm -hmm. I'm gonna go in the top. Gotcha. Epoxy is a possibility, except that I find it messy to mix, mix up a little batch. CA works for an ornament. Yeah. Well, I think, um... I don't think we really have time for another one, but maybe the, can we just make sure there's no other questions? If anybody wants to unmute yourself and, and ask Alan a question about the uh, ornament or any, anything else you think he might be able to answer for you? Well, just to maybe add here a little bit, I showed you this one. Mm -hmm. This is a companion piece of a piece of uh, walnut that a limb that so it's just a natural edge or a live edge is the other word for it. Small little bowl. I, and the process was to turn a tenon on one, end, one side of it while it's clamped in, held in against my jaws with a live center, just enough so I can cut in, cut in a small tenon for my smallest chuck, my smallest chuck jaws. Then uh, shape the outside of the uh, of this a little bit more, and then flip it around, hold it in a chuck, refine that outside edge, and then make the natural edge bowl just like you would do if it was big. The one difference is that before I finished, I drilled a three eighths inch hole in this case through the bottom. Then it was a little bit tricky to get the bottom finished, but uh, if you've done bowls, you can you've done that. So that's just another style of ornament. Does that and pith this, um, give you any trouble? Or is it? Well, the pith is right here and right here. And in this case, since it's already dry, uh, no. Uh, if this were wet, that could be a problem. Yeah. Good thing to use those little scraps for. Oh, they're perfect. I mean, this, yeah. <laughs> And it didn't crack when it was drying so far, so I don't think it's going. It's two years dead. So. Oh yeah, it's not. Shouldn't be going anywhere now. Not going anywhere now. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, I have a thank you. Just thank you for being there and doing this demo. That was great. Yeah, really. Thanks, Alan. That was really good. And uh, well, Gloria the, too. Thank you for her help. The thanks that you can give me is to make your ornament and send it into the challenge coming up. November 1st, we'll accept them. 
November 30, we cut them off, and then we start announcing things afterwards. Great, right. we'll do. If, if NorCal <laughs> is the uh, one of the top three, you can have another demo. Oh, free. that sounds good. That's a good reason. <laughs> I'll be sending emails out to everybody about it. Um, it. If I remember right, it's one photo of the ornament. Is that how it works? Yes, uh, one photo of the ornament. You can submit multiple ornaments, but only one picture per. Okay. So make it a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, if you really got to have multiple views, then you got to compose it into one picture. Oh, okay. So you could do a, um, a little composite of two or three shots into yeah, one but, JPEG. But that's, that's in your Photoshop, not my Photoshop. Gotcha. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds, that's very reasonable. And then we just ask uh, your contact information and then, uh, Still working out exactly how to do the coupons. I might be asking what your coupon preference is. So, mm, very since good. we have international participants, also we've got to regulate and figure out how to do that. So, mm. cool. All right, I'm going to remove this spotlight, and we're just going to be on speaker view. So, if anybody um, wants to say anything, you can, and maybe just anybody wants to thank Alan or last minute question, feel free to do that. Yeah, I just want to thank you, Alan, uh, for giving us the demo, and I've been looking forward to having it for a long time. So thank you very much for that. And are you on the same uh, time zone as us? No, nope, he's not. I'm an hour uh, earlier than y'all. Okay, all right. Well, thanks for no. staying up. Oh, it's not that late yet, is it? <laughs> it's not like health. you're in hawaii or japan or something like that or england in england i have to get up early to give one yeah uh, really but i i can do demos on multiple topics uh so if you want another one here yeah we well we very likely will do that if unfortunately this COVID has put a crink in all of our our in-house meeting so well i'd love to travel to sacramento since i have a set of grandkids out near you in granite bay oh yeah uh, but yeah but uh but that takes a lot of time and travel so yeah. i like zoom as yeah. long as you as long as you participate like you have that's been great it's one of the best participative demos i've done oh good good well oh, congratulations thank you thank you, Alan. thank you it was very interesting and i uh, i trust you got your check okay Yes, it did. Thank you. <laughs> that was our treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Be nice to that guy. Got to pay for my cameras. <laughs> Alan, not only thank you for this demo, but especially thank you for the Saturday morning demos. Uh, okay. I get up. And that's the first thing I do is turn on the computer and see what you've done. So thank uh, you. So now, now, no one thing uh, to get that Saturday morning reminder. You actually, he actually subscribed on my website okay. uh, and not just on YouTube because YouTube changes its algorithm a lot and you may or may not get notified of a new video. Oh, but if you okay. sign on my website, I send you an email, you know it's there. It's going to be Saturday morning. So uh, that's an incentive to sign up on my website. Great. And his uh, website link was in yeah. the login information that I sent earlier today. So uh, there it is again. again. So those of you with a, if you can't write fast, grab your phone, take a picture of the screen. <laughs> if you don't know how to do a screenshot. <laughs> Unless you're on your phone, then it's a little then it's, complicated. Yeah, that's tricky. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we'll call it, let you go, or you can hang out for a while if you want. I'll, We're just I'll hang around go. a little bit more, but, uh, okay. but thank Sounds you. Good. I'll, well, I'll let, let Gloria go. <laughs>